Thank you very much uh, for uh, coming. Thanks to Rick Etkin and Ryan Ma and Mark Bussey, Creative Mornings. Uh, and thank you very much for coming. Thanks for your interest. I'm a photojournalist and social documentary photographer. I've been doing that for about 32 years on five continents. But before that impresses anybody, let me refer you to the wisdom of Oscar Wilde, who wrote the experience is what people call their mistakes. I've got a lot of experience. Um, in my youth, photography was, uh, I searched for visions of self-exploration, self-expression, anything that would nurture my imagination. But I got on to different kinds of books like Edward Steichen, uh, uh, The Family of Man, and reform photographers like Jacob Rees, Lewis Hines, and Dorothy Lang. And I, I started uh, this fascination with uh, visual narratives, which landed me into the trenches of photojournalism and documenting the human condition in many of its manifestations. I hope what you're going to see today uh, qualifies for the theme. It's a broad interpretation. And uh, as a photographer, I like to think I have good vision. <laughs> um, some of my editors over the years have claimed otherwise. Um, I, I was a couple of hours west of Chicago uh, documenting President Clinton on the, uh, who was uh, landing in the Midwest to respond to uh, the flood, the flood uh, calamity. And what you're seeing is uh, Joe Schnenkloth, who's the farm owner's son. I'm beside CNN, Chicago Sun-Times, and it's in a very small area. Clinton was on his way to uh, a, a summit in Tokyo. We didn't think he was going to stay very long. Joe Schnenkloth, the, the farm owner's son, he was pretty excited being by the president, and uh, he thought that position was uh, pretty cool. Well, then he started thinking, maybe it's not so cool, uh, because President Clinton kept on droning on and droning on. And uh, <laughs> we were, he was getting restless, as, uh, as the press were, where everybody was looking at their watches. And uh, so Clinton kept droning on and uh, <laughs> passed everybody's deadlines. And uh, we don't know what kind of, uh, he was like in a trance. And this, uh, <laughs> this boy who was thinking to himself, I'm definitely not in the right place. And, uh, <laughs> and just when the Joe Schnenkloth thought, it just couldn't possibly get worse. <laughs> on a lark, I sent these to the White House because I heard a photojournalist got a watch from the Democratic Party doing that one time. And I got a, a letter back, thank you for the, your gracious support of our party. <laughs> well, that was a dumb thing to do, but anyway. <laughs> What's hidden about this? It never ran. And nobody's pictures ran that, that I know because we were past everybody's deadlines. Uh, this went on for like forever. Um, I was, this was the front page of the Winnipeg Free Press where I was a staff photographer uh, a while ago. And this was, I was covering this Crocus Sun, uh, Sun Club. I may have that wrong. Uh, and this, as I say, landed on the front page, but there was some vulgarity attached to it in that over 100 people canceled their subscriptions, wanted nothing to do with looking at naked men uh, on their breakfast table, despite these body parts being hidden. So uh, it, re it was quite a re uh, response and uh, a lot of intolerance associated with that. <laughs> this is uh, something that is usually hidden. In a very, uh, there's a practical name for this uh, in Chinese. I don't recall it at the, in a moment, but uh, it's, it's in uh, Shanghai. Um, I was working for the New York Times in a business story, and the fellow on the left, he, uh, him and I are waiting patiently for the human traffic to go by. And at, when, whenever I'm waiting, you know, photographers never stop seeing, they never stop watching. And I saw somebody come by with a plaid shorts, and I thought it was kind of an interesting abstract. And the juxtaposition, um, I thought, was kind of, kind of cool. Uh, this is Olympic Games. This is uh, uh, 
uh, Ane Morand and Antoine uh, Doraz from Switzerland. I, 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 the amputation is done inside my camera. And uh, so I, it, it, the appendages are kind of going different places. So this is what editors are looking for. Uh, it, they're, rather than you know, the standard uh, you know, banal images that uh, come out in mass consumption, we all do that. I was in, uh, uh, in La Paz, Bolivia. I was photographing Iranian President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad and um, uh, President Evo Morales. Is this, and at, right after that, I was photographing the Chilidas. These are indigenous women, Aymara and Quechua, that are in the ring with their petticoats wrestling men. The, the, the women of Bolivia have long uh, suffered at, you know, uh, from misogynistic ideas and subjugation by, uh, by males, and they really have convinced uh, me that this is a, a feminist surge. So the, the woman on the, on the right, that's Carmen Rosa, that's her husband, La Fiera, who's got a stick on her throat. It's not always so delicate and pretty. <laughs> Uh, and as I'm photographing this, I'm right on the, I'm on the ropes and there's chicken bones being thrown at me, not necessarily me, but them, I hope it's them, but there's themes of good and evil, so I was a victim of some of that, and to the backdrop of uh, dodgy, scratchy speakers playing Andean, uh, you know, folkloric music. So uh, then, you, you know, if you pay your dollar, if you pay your dollar, you can do whatever you want and you can respond any way you want. I look, uh, when I'm taking pictures, it's in fleeting seconds of opportunity, sometimes in rapidly changing environments. And um, it's, I'm always measuring and evaluating light's fusion uh, with shadow. And it's with an uh, ethnographic perspective in that I'm looking at uh, the, the daily rhythms of life, and it, which never fails to uh, yield uh, interesting social structures and human identity. This picture here is in Mombasa. It was made with, on a contract with the Canadian International Development Agency. And uh, I photograph, I guess, uh, um, spontaneously uh, with a casual precision sometimes. And uh, I, I do get a, a lot of influence from uh, particularly 17th century Dutch painters. And I, uh, I love looking at art. I love looking at the prehistory of art, etching, engraving, painting, and sculpture. This is uh, in uh, Xinjiang, China, the, at the intersection of Pakistan, Afghanistan, China. Uh, this is a Uyghur boy in a tandoori oven. And uh, this is a very fascinating part of the world that, uh, that's not often exposed. There are seven million Uyghurs, but there's this whole diaspora of Central Asian ethnicities, uh, uh, the uh, Uzbeks and Tajiks, Kyrgyz and Kazakh people. And it's uh, a, a very fascinating part. And uh, I like shooting at the, the, the if, give, if given the chance, the first part of the day and last part of the day when light is more elastic and pliant. This is uh, what happens when you chain yourself to Obama's fence. This is the White House in Washington, D.C. Sixty people were detained here and, and uh, arrested. This was uh, in protest to what they feel are egregious violations of human rights with respect to the American foreign policy with Guantanamo Bay, and uh, in uh, Afghanistan. In uh, Kosovo, uh, I, I worked a lot in the Balkans doing lots of different kinds of stories, including microcredit programs, but also refugee camps. This is a, a Roma boy who is just peering under, underneath this uh, building uh, in the refugee camp. And uh, the, the Romas have uh, long been uh, you know, subject, uh, they've been victims of public and hidden discrimination uh, for a long time. The, many are stateless in Europe, they're bouncing around for centuries and uh, very difficult uh, for them to get uh, public health care. And, and so it's, uh, it's a very fascinating story and it's one that I would like to return to. I thought I'd give you just a splash of color here. Uh, it's an, I worked in polar Greenland documenting stories on Inuit technology. I was uh, in Karkata, Kangalushwak and Kanak. Uh, and uh, it's a very, uh, uh, a fascinating part of the world. Now, the downtown east side, I did some work for the New York Times as well as Vancouver Magazine, and it's, as many of you know, it's teeming with social conditions of uh, homelessness, mental health, and addictions. It's my personal opinion that the solutions to urban decay and social crisis really uh, ostensibly you know, lay in the the balance of those that wield power, but I think photojournalism can play a role in this and, and stimulate conversation and when it's done right, prod collective consciousness. There's a responsibility to photographing uh, uh, disadvantaged people and it's one I take very seriously. Attention has to be given uh, to dignity. 
but it's not without uh, its uh, high voltage criticism and uh, withering scrutiny. And I, uh, I welcome that. In this uh, case here, this is uh, Susan who's taking, uh, euphemistically it's called a jug shot. It's, uh, she's taken cocaine and uh, um, heroin inside of her rig and uh, inside of the throat. And part of the questions that, uh, that are uh, legitimate questions that are raised through photojournalism like mine are, it, it, are, are cameras in photojournalists' hands, are they predatory tools or are they instruments of social function and construction? And, and I do like very much to uh, be engaged in this kind of dialogue because I think photographers need to deconstruct what they do. We need to uh, talk a lot about it because the, 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 the subject is very serious and people do matter. And, I, and I, what I don't want to do is, you know, when I'm photographing people, I, I'm conscious, am I taking their autonomy away? Am I taking their dignity away? There's a responsibility to have some literacy about every assignment that we do. And that means uh, learning as much. In my, my introduction to downtown Eastside many years ago was harm reduction. The, I guess this fits well with the theme of, of hidden. Uh, there's a fellow there who's got his bottles in his cart and he's uh, uh, kind of waiting until this, the doors open where he could sell them and, and then sustain his uh, drug addiction. Uh, no matter what the context of the assignment is, uh, even socially engaged photographers still have to look at harmony and geometry and, and balance and rhythm. And in this kind of photograph here, I'm still very aware, I'm aware of the context of what I'm trying to say, but I'm still having to aestheticize uh, this, uh, this story. This is a Pat from Toronto who's pick, picking up a rig, punctuating the fact that this is the, one of the perils of, of looking for garbage uh, for things that he can find and sell and su support his addiction. This is a Tuareg uh, nomad. I was, doing, I was flown to Mali and Madagascar to do stories on the malaria. Afterwards, I went up to the ancient outpost of Timbuktu and uh, made this uh, portrait as he just come off the Sahara Desert in North Africa. In Afghanistan, I did stories for the Independent in a newspaper in London and also an NGO. This, the, there's, according to the UN, there's over 1 million people addicted to opium. Now, 50% of the uh, parents that are addicted medicate their children to calm them to sleep and also to relieve pain. This is Abdul Hamid, he's 13 years old. His father is addicted, his mother and his two sisters. They've lost everything through trying to sustain this addiction. And uh, his mother's got a, a, a drug resistant tuberculosis and it's a, it's a very serious story and one that isn't uh, widely told uh, in the world. In, I was in Iraq uh, three years ago documenting uh, a lot of different kinds of stories uh, with in internally displaced people. This is in uh, Al Waid uh, refugee camp. 80% of the refugee camps that I went to uh, were women, uh, different ethnicities, Yazidis, uh, Shabaks and Kurds, Palestinians and of course now flooded with many Syrians and Alawites and and uh, this is, uh, this is the, these, these are siblings, but her, this, these two women, this child and, and sister, with their mother live in, the, and this is their home. With the, with the increasing sectarian violence, the, 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 the social pressures and the, 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 uh, the inflation of refugee camps is just going, spinning out of control. I worked in, uh, uh, in uh, Shiva temple in, near Kathmandu called Pashupadinath on the Bagmati River. Now, the, the, the sadhus are, uh, live austere lives. They're, um, they live, they, they follow, they're, they're trying to search for uh, uh, self-control, discipline, peace, and trying to achieve moksha to break the cycle of birth and death. Some, it's, there, there's some contradictions become some are hucksters and, and uh, charlatans. This is uh, Radha Baba uh, on the left and Lulu Baba on the right. And they're, they're trying to emulate Shiva to the extent that they're putting uh, paste on their body. And they also believe Shiva was en engaged with hashish for the, with respects to the religious consumption. Now what's going on here is they're pumping away with all this hashish. I'm in a very small room. And what's the, the idea is, is that they're with, they look at the smoke signals to see uh, what the cosmic nature of God might be. I was seeing what the cosmic nature of God was <laughs> because I was like stoned. Uh, I, I could hardly, well, I put it on autofocus. I'm a kind of a control freak and I don't like autofocus. I was like, I bleary eyed. It kind of felt good though. But, um, 
um, in Africa, I, I love working with pre-industrial uh, lifestyles, and I saw a book uh, uh, years ago, Irving Penn's uh, Worlds in a Small Room, where he took a, his ambulance studio around, around, around the depths of Africa and, and elsewhere in the world and photographed all these hidden cultures. This is Bonko, and he's a mercy man uh, in southern Ethiopia. Now, the guns are important because they, uh, they uh, ward off people that are trying to steal the cattle, and as well, they're also, there's intense competition for grazing land in the area. The Mercy people are a subsistent agro-pastoralists, and their lifestyle was being threatened by many different outside forces, and one of them being there's this huge massive hydroelectric dam coming. It's, it's in place now, and it's mucking up the river cycle. So that's a problem because they, they rely on a, this flood retreat cultivation method. Also, there's many foreign countries um, acquiring huge, uh, vast areas of land uh, for uh, biofuels and crop. And these uh, indigenous cultures, these ancient indigenous cultures, are being pressured from the contagion of the world outside. These are the mercy women with ubiquitous uh, lip plates. And they are uh, a symbol of uh, um, a beauty and a commitment to culture uh, and other things, depending on who you talk to. But uh, this is, uh, starts when they're 15 years old, the incisors are taken out and they, they get a smaller plate and they progressively get um, large. I had my tent next to this, their uh, conical shaped uh, huts and stilted granaries all washed in dust, including me. This is the Hammer people and this is called Goscha and they've got, this is, the hair is created with animal grease, uh, a water and a, a concoction of a, a natural ochre and a portrait I made of a, uh, of a young uh, mercy boy. There's aestheticizing tragedy always falls in the orbit of analytical debate. The, the fact of the matter is, there's two things I'd like to say about that, and one is, is that it's impossible to ethically circulate pictures, and two is that these pictures, human suffering pictures, do bankroll intervention. They also reveal a lot of uncomfortable realities. I, I worked in a Waprabhadam Po, which is a Buddhist AIDS temple near Bangkok for ties in late stages of AIDS. And um, this is where people, most people dying of opportunistic infections. So uh, this is another story all into itself. But uh, um, I don't want my images to modify pity. Uh, I, I want them to be authentic. I want them to tell stories. This is a Khmer Rouge man. I, I covered a lot of stories in Batabong province in Cambodia where we're uh, looking and documenting landmine clearing. He's repatriated back into the land, ironically, that he, during the 30-year, during the conflict, he and his cadres mined. And he, he was very philosophical about the fact that he lost his leg on, on, the, on tracts of land during the war, that he, land, he mined, uh, he installed uh, landmines to seal off agricultural areas. I worked in Bangladesh for a while, and this is uh, on many stories, but this is a floating hospital up in the northern Char areas on the Brahmaputra River. This hospital, this floating hospital, off offers primary and secondary health care to, uh, uh, to the needy people, where doctor-patient ratios are 1 to 65,000. So there's a lot of uh, special needs here, and I was very fortunate to be part of that. I worked in uh, a lot of Palestinian camps in the Middle East. This is Einwal Helwe, and it is uh, described as the zone of lawlessness um, by Lebanese press. It is, incubates all kinds of uh, uh, interesting ideologies and uh, uh, radical Islamic behavior, the mutated and isolated theologies, and it is hemorrhaging violence. It always hemorrhages violence. This is one of the most dangerous places to be in the Middle East. This is a Fada boy who gets 15 years old who gets paid $100 a month to keep peace up and down the streets, and there's elderly men, there's children, sorry, boys as young as him uh, patrolling around. In Nahar al barad it's a Palestinian camp north of Beirut, it was heavily bombed and, uh, and shelled for three months as Lebanese military was attacking Fatah al-Islam. And uh, I was there after the shelling, and this is a, 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 I was a, and it's an enormous privilege. I was invited to be with a family to re, that returned to their home. This is the first time she saw her home since she saw a rocket-propelled grenade go through her kitchen wall. There was the, the, the somber feeling, she was a, a muted response. She, she never had any other, ex, other expression. 
It's, uh, this is uh, you know, part of uh, what I do, and, and I, I like to uh, think that you know, these stories are relevant. Um, I'd like to talk about Yaya Sangalu. It's a mental health center in uh, Jakarta, Indonesia. It's a place uh, that hosts all kinds of different uh, undiagnosed uh, conditions of meth methamphetamine psychosis, impulse control disorders, uh, uh, autism, dementia, sch schizophrenia. They, they're these, because of the social stigma of mental health, people at home are either buried inside, sometimes in little cages. In this case, they're, they're buried in, in, in warehoused in, uh, in the Aya San Galu. Um, there is, uh, there's no psychotherapy, there's no occupational therapy, and there's no psychiatric medicine. People are just waiting here for sometimes years and, and years. And there's a the shackling that you're looking at is called pasung, and it is basically the translation from Bahasa Indonesia is that it is uh, uh, um, restrains, be being restrained. The the there's the most not all, but many Indonesian people believe that mental health is not a neurological disorder, but that it is, they believe in supernatural explanations. They believe that the uh, the demons are coming in to infiltrate their loved ones' minds. And they, they, their response theologically is that their, their religion is syncretic in that they, they adapt different theologies. So they bring in um, dukans and tabibs. These are spiritual healers who are trying to root out evil by administering uh, through some uh, deranged folkloric wisdom uh, concoctions of uh, coconut water and uh, uh, leaves. Uh, and to no ph pharmacological effect. And uh, so there's, the, the mental health in the world is, is really one of the most uh, um, discarded elements of, of uh, human development. It gets a fraction of the response that AIDS and TB and malaria does. And 1% of the national health budget of Indonesia goes towards uh, this, towards this. Some cling to the utility of religion here, some cling just to human solidarity. There's a real contagion of fear and there's a commonality of, of despair. This is one of the darkest you know, intersections uh, that, I, that I've covered in, in the world. Some parents come up and, and, and they, they're, they're asking why their loved ones haven't been cured. The Tabib had, and the Dukans haven't cured them, and they say, well, if that didn't work, how come it didn't work? Because we changed the names of our loved ones. Uh, Indonesians I've talked to changed the first names to try and fool, fool the demons. And there's such a misconception, and so much education needs, is required to, 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 to be installed in Indonesia. It's happening, in, 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 incrementally it's happening, but it's a, it's a place of uh, intense, uh, there's an aura of intense melancholy here. And perpetual weeping, auditory hallucinations, frantic narratives. There are times that I become precipitously close to danger. When the door shuts and the, and the lock is on, I'm in the room with some people that have been brought off the streets by police. And, uh, and uh, some of the people that had worked there uh, basically say, good luck if you want to stay here. Uh, it is a, a place where there's no medical attention. People, are, wounds are festering um, under this oppressive heat. They live uh, in cages. This is Anini, who is alone in the solitary of her own dispossession. This is Taid, who has uh, been here for years shackled. They, they go to the bathroom where they eat, and they eat where they go to the bathroom. To your left is the trench. And uh, it's, uh, it's certainly an egregious violation of human rights going on here. There's over, it's estimated there's over 18,000 people in uh, Indonesia that are shackled or chained in this way. Help is on the way, but it's very small, and it's very d difficult to get the kind of funding and attention. This is where I think Vitarvi can make a difference. This is Janwar. Janwar is, uh, he's reacting to not getting his nasi, his rice on this day, and um, I have to, the people see me with, you know, they're repellent of me and sometimes suspicious. I negotiate understanding. I try and develop um, some uh, level of friendship and communication. And I, I, 
I, I, in, my, in my job, you can't be disingenuous or disconnected, incurious. I, I, you can't manufacture humility. You can't parachute into these kinds of jobs and look for the best you know, images, the best aesthetic images, and, and, and then blow out again. I really do care. I really care about the people that I photograph, and there's, there's this, again, there's this sense of literacy that's required. I've got a lot to learn about all the assignments. Uh, uh, that I've covered, and I'm, I'm not an expert in any of them, but I'm learning and I'm, I'm trying to understand my responsibility in, to people that are suffering in the global community. Um, this is Yadi, and she's from uh, Bali. She um, has no articulation of speech, and uh, so we're not, we're not always sure what she's thinking, but she, she just she cries all day. She just cries incessantly all day. It's very sad, and... Uh, but she's, she's not dangerous, and she's, so consequently, she gets to live outside of the cages. This is Sahari. She's caged here because she was flirting with boys. There's some very strict discipline uh, that, go, that goes on here. I, I've searched the ruins of human depredation and human uh, degradation as, as well. Um, I've really thought a lot about people that are, have been airbrushed from history for inexplicable reasons. I really believe that photography can make a difference to social justice issues. I believe it could uh, shape questions, and I believe that it can give attention to vulnerable people living in the shadows. Thank you very much for having me. I'm going to ask you the first question, Wendell. I couldn't help but think, as I watched these images, I've traveled a lot, but oh my god. Like, I feel like I'm a rookie compared to the, the type of immersive experiences you've had. I'm emotionally moved, um, probably even changed every time I go to another country by their culture. When I saw the images that you've produced, and I consider the, those experiences, I kind of almost think that it would traumatize me, like it would harm me, my soul, my, my, my mind. How do you decompress? When you come back from these places, how do you process this? I think in some ways I, I compartmentalize things and maybe sometimes I don't do it as, you know, in, in, the, in, the, in the best ways. But I, do, I am very conscious of recalibrating my uh, serenity meter. <laughs> I, I do that by, uh, you know, drinking green tea, listening to Tchaikovsky, and reading good books. Um, I, I can't, I, 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 pro, I photograph this on the front lines and the people that are living on the margins of existence. And I come home and I, I can't, uh, I, I bring some of it home. One of the most traumatic things for me was the earthquake in Haiti. And uh, you still bring it home. You can't be, I, I shoot dispassionately, but uh, I'm still there and my heart's still there. And I, I, I'll oscillate between, you know, the human development photographer and, and the journalist. You know, the objectivity and, and, and uh, that I'm, I'm, I'm very aware that I'm bringing uh, my own mental pollution, I, I'm my, own re my own references, and I, I, I would like to make the most authentic photos poss possible. Susan Sontag wrote uh, about in uh, regarding the pain of others that the the, the photographs are the ones that photographers choose, that the photographs, uh, the, the, the photographer frames. And when the photographer frames, the photographer excludes. And so I'm very aware that when I'm out in the field that I'm, uh, I'm bringing my own frame of reference. And uh, I, I, I bring these pictures home and I process them. And to get back to your point is I, I, I think about when I come back and while I'm recalibrating my serenity meter, I'm also thinking about how effective was I in telling these stories. Because the premise of photojournalism is telling stories. It's not about photographing pictures and, you know, impressing you with my clever angles. I achieve, when I feel like I've achieved something, I think it's not because you think I'm a clever photographer and I've, I work with light very well. I think that I, I hope and I, and I love it when people say, I, I learned something, and, and, and what, what else can I do? Who, who can I talk to? And, and so I'm very rewarded by that. And some people ask me, you know, well, what ways do the photographs uh, make differences? 
beyond the scope of this conversation, but just recently the, or, the organization I'm working was worked for in Bangladesh. Uh, they've asked me to be part of an exhibition in Luxembourg where they're raising money um, um, for photos, uh, the sale of photos, uh, and that will go to the uh, Kuakata, Bangladesh, to build a cyclone shelter. But everybody contributes in, in different ways, and, and, and so uh, I, I, there's more to say about that, but it would be beyond I this imagine. discussion. I yeah. imagine. Who has a question? Um, I'm just curious, I know, um, I grew up in a military town and um, the soldiers that go into theater and then, which is a great word, um, and then they come back, I never understood why they would want to go back again until I actually saw a photographic exhibition, well I didn't see it, it was online, but <laughs> um, where it showed the, the guys before, little baby faces, and then showed them looking incredibly alive when they're in that place of danger and then they come back and they look quite empty um, and I'm curious do you feel compelled to keep going back like do you do you feel kind of more alive when you're actually in places where you're pushing deeper inside yourself and for your talents and what story you can tell like do you feel a need to keep going back I feel the, the, the need to be continually getting engaged with people that have stories to tell that I think that are hidden. Um, there's, in this small group we were just talking about photographing uh, disadvantaged, disenfranchised people and there was some, some comment about you know, the un, how uncomfortable that might be and how do you do it. And, and, and I was in Wat Prabha Nam Po in the, there was a, one of the Buddhist monks of AIDS, emaciated, sitting in the corner, I, who, had, who has, had good English better than my Thai. I asked him, I said, how do you want to be represented? And he didn't say a word. He just went like this. Photograph. Photograph whatever you see. I'm not, I'm not probably answering your question. I just thought that it came to my mind. Um, I think that I really, I always want to go back into the field working <laughs> Um, because I think that uh, the stories are so intriguing. I think that there's this altruistic penchant I have to, to make these stories, to share the stories. And um, I think that, I really think Fatarvi, you know, can um, play a supporting and central role to, uh, you know, social justice. I've seen it work and I've seen it fail miserably. A demonstrable grief because of the pictures that have been published in newspapers where we've actually hurt people. And 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 please don't you know, uh, please don't be under any misapprehensions. I've I, I've I've crossed the line. Every photojournalist does where you're making decisions and you know you'll let the editors think about it later. I've crossed the lines and and there'll be stories and anecdotes I wouldn't be wanting to share. Uh, but that shame. And that education made me a better photographer and made me a better human. And because I, I could think about some stories now that I shouldn't have photographed. Great question. Thanks for speaking today, Wendell. Um, I was wondering, you spoke about an obligation for learning every time you head in to a different assignment. I would wonder if you could share your process for learning as much as you can in the short time frame that you have. I, I try and glean everything I can from every possible source. Um, whether it's on the internet, whether it's people in the field. You know, there, there's a responsibility, you know, a photographer is not, you know, more than just showing up with a camera and where's all the good images. And I've been on assignments in my youth where I felt uh, I was uh, under-resourced, you know, in, in, <laughs> mentally. And, and, and I learned from people, from mentors that, um, that said, uh, told me and instructed me saying, if you're going to be in the field, understand, you know, have a better understanding of what you're doing. It, it, it really... It's part of the respect and it's part of that uh, dignity that you give people that when you land into an assignment that, you, as I said before, you have some you know, sense of literacy. So I get it from very many, many different areas and, and also those things open doors. The more information you know, uh, the more you see. And that didn't make a whole lot of difference to me when I was 20 years old. But as I got older I, and I started doing more research and preparing myself, I started asking questions that I otherwise wouldn't have asked and it, it led to opportunities that I wouldn't have seen had I not been researched. So, and so there's, there's 
different aspects to that. Yeah. This side. A lot of your stuff is uh, well off the beaten path. Have you gotten in trouble for maybe being in places that you shouldn't be or exposing the darker sides of these countries that they may want to not show? Or uh, yeah, we've gotten gotten in trouble. Uh, you know, there, there's uh, lots of adversity. You know, where, where I'm documenting people in, you know, in in the uh, tragedy and triumph. And uh, uh, what can I think of? Uh, I was in Einwal Helwe uh, in a Palestinian camp making pictures and we were doing stories in the Middle East on war orphans, not of the conflict or, or the, uh, the radical militias that were uh, circulating around. And I was inside, I, I made the photograph of that young man with a gun. So we, about 20 feet away, we're inside of our, 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 uh, the place we needed to be. Uh, a woman with her son, the bullet holes were strewn all through her fridge from a fight the day before they went through her windows. And so we're sitting there and so all of a sudden somebody came in with this frantic look in their face saying Fatah heard that a Fatah was photographing this boy and there's going to be hell to pay basically. And uh, so my colleague from Islamabad was a, was a little bit more panicked than he should be. This is a kind of job where you have to kind of keep your composure. If you can't be emotional and you gotta, you gotta think straight. And so I figured, well, you know, they're, they're, gonna, come at, they're gonna come for us and uh, so what do we do with the images? And the, my colleague said, well, let's take them, let's clean them off the cards. I said, no, that's what you don't wanna do. Because if you clean them off the cards, then they think, well, what else have you done? You gotta kind of show them the photo that you made. <laughs> But, but, but what I did was I had, a, I had a hard drive. Now in this particular camp, by the way, I wasn't going in as a photojournalist, I might add. I was going in as an NGO person because journalists at this time weren't, weren't allowed. And my equipment was brought in on garbage bags on the backs of Palestinian women. And I was, I was walking through the Lebanese checkpoints. I was saying to my colleague, you know these women, right? Because there goes my gear in a garbage bag <laughs> down there. And he goes, we, we know them pretty good. <laughs> $25,000 a year is going the other way. Um, nothing happened there, but uh, uh, they, we were, they were searching for us. And uh, what I did was I had a little a bit of power on this little portable uh, hard drive with a screen. I downloaded all the images, which I was going to do uh, later. And I, I was downloading, downloading, and then I packed it. And then we put it uh, with a Palestinian woman who brought it out. But I made sure that I, I kept that. May, maybe not be the best anecdote. I've been, I've been at gunpoint twice with some confusion. Um, I, I don't like, you know, exaggerating stories. I actually didn't feel so much fear uh, because they're young men with guns are, can be very uh, overzealous. And uh, so it's, uh, there's, you're always negotiating uh, in, in the field. I'm working often with different languages, different circumstances, people that see me as a threat, people that see me as a friend. We show up uh, uh, with the United Nations vehicle and they're thinking we're going to save them. Sometimes we show up in the United Nations vehicle and they're thinking, you're about the 10th photographer we had in two years and we've had no change in our village. What are you doing here? And what, 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 what hope can we expect from you? So, it's a slow process. <laughs> I think my favorite quote so far from you is, young men with, gun young men with guns can be overzealous. <laughs> 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 Okay, we can just get a couple more. We're running out of time here. Uh, my question is about just the world of photojournalism. I know that a lot of newspapers are getting rid of their their photo staff. Um, like the Globe and Mail just let go of you know half of their photographers and other newspapers in the States have done the same. What do you see as the future of photojournalism? Are people going to be staff photographers? I assume a lot more freelance is happening and how do you continue to make a career of that and yeah. be financially stable yourself? Well, I don't know exactly the answer to that. I do know that, you know, civilian photojournalism is, news photography gathering rather is becoming more participatory and pictures are being, uh, you know, uploaded in unprecedented levels. And it's really changing the face of photojournalism. Uh, and I don't know where the future is going to go. Um, I think that, I, ho I like to think that photojournalists aren't going to go the, the, by the way of blacksmiths. Uh, but uh, I think it's uh, definitely changing. I, I believe uh, from anybody aspiring to be a photojournalist, I, in my personal opinion, you, you have to be uh, equipped with uh, knowledge of uh, you know, collecting audio and sequencing you know, video uh, stills. And I also think you should learn how to write. Um, and I think there's still opportunities in the, in the future for photojournalists, but I think it's morphing into something that, uh, something that we're, we're not familiar, uh, that 
people of my vintage never saw coming. And I'm not sure I'd exactly answer your question other than uh, I really, uh, you know, believe that uh, there's still, there's huge power in photographs. And I, th I think that it's, it, you just got to find different ways of circulating. And I think that you've got, if you're, if you have ambitions of being a photojournalist, I think you have to be in front of opportunity, not behind it. And, and, and if you don't know uh, what, what I mean by that, then you're probably behind it. <laughs> That's all the time we have for questions today. Uh, Wendell, thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate this.